السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, Your Excellencies Ladies and Gentlemen Our Smart Guests Very happy to welcome you today to what promises to be one of the most mind and I would think forward thinking seminars we've had this season so far. I would like to welcome our guest speaker, keynote speaker, Mr. Wim Elfring. But before that, I would like to take us through a brief journey of why we are here today. You know, between in the 1990s, the dot-com business was very rife. Everything was internet, internet-based. The internet was, was, at that time, everything. And suddenly, in, in, in the year 2000, the internet or the dot-com bubble burst, burst on the 10th of March 2000, I think, if I'm precise. And the whole world didn't know what was happening. Everybody's basic beliefs were shattered. This thing seemed to be a very short-lived dream or, or, or memory. What happened in the year 2000? The year 2000 was a very significant year. Because how did this affect Dubai? Dubai, of course, interacts to all the events, global events. And sure enough, Dubai had some action that involved its positioning with this. Was Dubai following a trend? As sometimes it's rumored, and I think now everybody is following the Dubai trend, but at that time, people were wondering if Dubai was following a trend and what trend that was. Was Dubai daydreaming? Dubai, you know, I don't think Dubai dreams at night even. And it's always reality in Dubai. Thinking, possibly. Was it a mirage? A lot of things were happening at the time. No, none of this. Visions and visionaries is what brings us here. And we do have a visionary amongst us today who will speak to us at length, hopefully, after this. But international vision at the time. Almost all of the many predictions now being made about 1996 hinge on the Internet's continuing exponential growth. But I predict the Internet will soon go spectacularly supernova and in 1996 catastrophically collapse. This was one of the predictions made in 1996 at, a, at an international level. And this was a serious prediction because the one who made this was none other than Robert Metcalf, who is the co-inventor of Ethernet co-inventor of Ethernet and founder of 3Com. What could be more credible or more, you know, assuring or more convincing than such a prediction being made? What did history think of this? Visionaries with really bad eyesight. Absolutely. That was really a vision, but the visionary had bad eyesight. Dubai had a vision at the same time. In, in, on the 29th of October of the year 2000, Dubai had a vision. What is Dubai's vision? Dubai's vision is in this book. I couldn't put it on a slide, actually, so the book is there, and I think many of us have seen the book, many of us have seen the results of this book before. This is the Dubai vision. This is what set or what tried to capture some of the Dubai essences. This was the Dubai vision. The biggest risk is not taking risk at all. And Sure enough, on that day, that was the day when His Highness inaugurated the Dubai Internet City. When everybody was thinking supernova, belly up, all the other terms, Dubai was launching its Internet City, a very unique development at the level of the world. And it's been a very quick and sweet journey ever since. In 2001, the Dubai e-government was born with all the activities and all the efforts that has led to where we are today. Soon enough, well, not maybe soon enough, but 12 years, the M government came. They didn't stay very long because the Dubai smart government came immediately after that. And in 2014, the Dubai Smart City Initiative was announced. I think it's a typo because the, the declaration of His Highness did not call for Dubai to become a smart city. He asked for Dubai to become the smartest city. I think this is an underlying, uh, you know, I, I do believe sometimes that Dubai is already a smart city. But our thrive today is to be the smartest city, not just another smart city. Uh, 
this happened yesterday. We had nothing to do with arranging this visit or arranging this timing, but I think Mr. Jack uh, Yam is the founder of Alibaba, which is one of the biggest businesses going ready to launch the biggest IPO in history in the next few weeks and already raising the level, the benchmark for the price level. And some of the statements or the tweets that came yesterday were from His Highness Sheikh Mohammed's media office announcing that we are the technology hub for two billion people living around it as it hosts the world's top technology brands. We're serving a third of the world from the UAE. And in his Arabic statements, for those who don't understand, he says, the UAE has bet from the beginning on technology. And it's one of the first countries that have invested in a fully integrated, comprehensive infrastructure to host a full internet city. I will usher you into uh, our very exciting lecture. We are very pleased and happy to have one of today's visionaries, I would say, Mr. Wim Elfring. Uh, each of the titles here requires a presentation on its own, but I will leave him to do his own, his own business here for us. And I look forward to your contributions and to your feedback afterwards. Mr. Wim, please. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Bassam. please. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thanks for joining me. And uh, Dr. Bassam, thanks for your introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of concepts. Um, I'm not going deep, uh, but I hope that uh, we'll have a question and answer and that you will question me and give me feedback what you think, uh, what you liked and didn't like. I will build it up basically in three chapters. First, uh, do we all need this? You know, technology, the internet of everything, smart cities. Uh, what, what is really the purpose? Uh, why is it so essential? Uh, not just for our future, but specifically the future of our children. Secondly, I um, want to talk about uh, the new industry, the Internet of Everything, how smart cities play into that, and then I will close with a couple of case studies and also talk about benefits and how we see governance models coming in place uh, to really take the maximum out of it. You know, one private word from myself. Um, in Cisco, I'm called Chief Globalization Officer. Uh, but, you know, I have a Dutch accent. Uh, I'm Dutch. And every four years I'm very tribal uh, with world champions in soccer, Olympic Games. Uh, tribalism is for me something good. Uh, it creates competitiveness. Uh, it makes you feel part uh, of a community. It gives you values. So I have an accent. And there are some Dutch people here in the audience even, and they can immediately hear that I'm from Rotterdam. And that because even in your accent, you can hear the next accent. So the 21st century, why do we need technology as a key enabler? We don't need technology because of the technology, but we need technology as a key enabler for solutions and outcomes. Why? If you look at the 21st century, it's going to be an amazing ride. First, and have we all already experienced that, the shift of GDP to the new power economies. I never say emerging markets or it are new power economies. And what is so underestimated is that in these new power economies, a lot of things start from scratch, greenfield. And I always say that God was able to create the world in seven days because there was no installed base. If you do things the first time, you can do it the first time, thinking out of the box, faster, and with greater passion. And that secondly, um, if we don't change our habits, then we will go in an enormous crisis of global warming, energy consumption. And if we don't change our patterns, uh, that uh, world energy demand will increase by 40%, and that is unsustainable. But probably uh, the most underestimated factor is the changing demographies, demographics. And that's the 21st century. If, if you look at the details, and uh, I'll give you a summary, uh, but I have, I always think in three concepts and three things. Uh, that, that's what I can remember, and uh, that's easy. Um, this is the percentage of people of 65 years and older. And uh, so the world is going from 10 to 20% of people of 65 years and older, and I'm going to be one of them. And some also in this audience, if I see that around me. Um, so, if you look at, for instance, Germany, 
uh, that 37% of the population will be 65 years and older. If you look at the second one, that's specifically Europe, it's not just a population that's aging, but also shrinking. Net shrink. That means that a country like Germany, that they need 2 to 3% productivity improvement every year to just maintain standard of living. So how do you plan for that? How do you go on with an aging population if you just think about cost of health care? And then you have the part of the world that is still getting younger. Um, and, of course, it doesn't apply to us, but in general, young people are more innovative than older people. I, I lived in India, and there was somebody who lectured me and said, you know, everybody above 40 is not really innovative anymore, because you are a prisoner of your own experiences. And you have always reasons why things are not possible. And so I have two boys. They are now 14 and 18. They have only two statuses in life. And they're either asleep or they're online. And whether I like it or not, that if we sit in the family room in the evening and they're always, I think, texting and doing things, and then, you know, Mr. Smart asks Mark, he then says, but Dad, I'm reading a book. I can't control it, but he tells me, I like still paper, and that's, you know, my kids have no keys. They used to keyless houses, keyless cars. And my wife hates not having a key. It is what is your experience, and if you think in that framework, you can't be innovative. And so if you look at the part of the world, country like India, going from 1.1 to 1.6 billion people, uh, that, that's in, they are adding a U.S. They are adding basically an Australia to their economy every year. Uh, the UAE, that's spectacular growth. Young people. Young people are mobile. And young people will move around. And so if you talk about competitiveness, and, and we strongly believe that the future of competitiveness is going to be between cities, economically, socially, and environmental. It's not just economics and attracting investors. More and more it will be who can attract talent, who can really source with knowledge the economy. So if you look at the challenges that we have to address based upon these three parameters, and then the World Bank estimates that 700 million people are going to be urbanized. That means 180,000 people a day now move from urban Rural area, from rural areas to urban areas. Um, I spent four years of my life in Bangalore between 2007 and 2011. In that city, 600 people a day come to the city. That means that physically you need a new school every quarter and you need a new hospital every year. And ladies and gentlemen, believe me, that's not going to happen physically. It's virtually impossible. If you think about China, there's an, an enormous mismatch already between supply and demand of talent. And also the US, that they talk about going back into manufacturing. But young people don't want to work in manufacturing. And they think it's old fashioned, it's not up to spec, and that they all want to be in marketing or lawyers, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody here, but STEM education is a big crisis already. And STEM education being science, technology, engineering, and math. It's the, the basis of the future. So always try to motivate your kids, whether they like it or not. But starting with STEM, the rest you can learn in your life. If you look at the developed world, um, in cities, a city like Detroit is bankrupt. Bankrupt. And they went down from 1.6 million citizens to 700,000. And they're closing down, they have to restart. And so a lot of developed countries have to rethink their purpose and their cities. And my home country, the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam, is more and more becoming a museum. And that, that city was built to go to your work. Nowadays, work also comes to you. So what is the purpose of the city? Well, what is the future? For one thing, it's, it's for sure, it's changing. And the competitiveness and the mobility is going to take a big toll. In the US, there, with an aging population, there is already a shortage of 2 million home workers for assisted living. There is a shortage of 300,000 doctors. And, and when the baby boomers are going to retire, it's even going to be a bigger issue. 
So if you look around, it, it's not just the emerging countries or the developed world, but we have a complete mismatch of supply and demand of talent. So how do we plan for that? If I take these things together, and then I look at the world aging and shrinking, Europe, the US, the Western world in general, and you can look at the hyper growth, the Middle East, Africa. So from a problem and challenges point of view, in the developed world, it's all about new value creation, productivity improvements. In the developing world, it's still access to healthcare and education. And let's not forget that we have a billion people on the planet who live off a dollar a day, who have no access to healthcare and education, and we know that it's unsustainable. We have to give a future for every citizen in the world. And then in the middle, energy demand, urbanization, talent mismatch, uh, that, that are the macro type of issues. And then uh, everything that we do has to be secure, environmental friendly. So technology is the way to move forward as an enabler. And let me give you some examples. But uh, first, um, have we live now in what we call the Internet of Things. We're connecting things. <laughs> 30 years ago, when we started, and then thanks for the history, and when we started with 30, it's only 30 years ago, you know how many devices were connected to the internet? Any idea? 3,000. Today, 13 billion. Moving to 50 billion. If we are an hour together here, we are connecting another 100,000 devices to the internet. 100,000 an hour. And it's exponentially growing. So if you think about it, the whole rate of adaptation um, is going faster and faster. Don't compare it to telephony. Don't compare it to electricity. And this is exponential. And I think, we think that 50 billion is even conservative. And basically, what, what, what you, so all these devices, sensors, other things, they suddenly lit up. And because they are connected and they go to generate data. And so it's going to be an enormous data world and what are we going to do with all that data? But the first concept I really want to plant with you is that look at technology as the new essential infrastructure. It's not just about water, gas and electricity. You have to have a master ICT plan. And when you build a city, you have to encompass an ICT chapter. And I'm amazed if you look around the world, and that 100 new cities and more are being built of a million people, a lot of them don't even have an ICT chapter. It's a complete afterthought. For a lot of architects, you know, it's about the design. It's about how it looks. It's not how it functions. And so just think in a master ICT plan and think as technology as a new essential infrastructure. And then not just infrastructure, but also application-centric. And we start living now in the world of apps, cell phones, tablets. It's all about apps. So if you think about it, these 50 billion devices that suddenly lit up and start producing data. And did you know that 90% of today's world data has been generated over the last two years? It's astonishing. More, than, more new data is generated in, in one year than the previous 5,000 years. And it's accelerating. And by 2020, we estimate that 40% of all the data will come from sensors that at the moment are not connected yet. A city like Singapore generates several terabytes of data every day. And uh, Walmart, as a retailer, generates one petabyte of data every hour. And one petabyte is similar to 3,000 years of streaming music. I learned it from my kids. That's something they understand. They have no idea what a petabyte of a terabyte is. But 3,000 years of streaming music is a concept that people understand. But data is not that relevant. Data is fine. But it's all about what are you going to do with it. And so how can you transform data in information? How can you transform information in knowledge? And how can you then transform knowledge in wisdom? And wisdom, with wisdom, you can take better informed decisions. 
Uh, but that's still also the, the classical way of you know, MBA type of folks uh, that who study and look at trends. Uh, but when you get a lot of data real time, how can you then be agile and, and stream as you go? And so it's not just better informed decisions, it's also being hands-on and really being real time. So data is going to be essential, and uh, data enables an explosion of applications. Uh, if you think about it, um, at this moment, uh, Gartner estimates that 140 billion applications have been downloaded. 140,000, 140 billion. Uh, astonishing numbers. And more and more, if I do press interviews, people don't ask me about technology, but they ask me, what is your favorite app? What is your favorite app? Think about it. It's a new way of thinking. And at the numbers again, on a worldwide basis, 100 movies are released, 250 books, and 15,000 apps. There will be an app for everything. And so an application-centric infrastructure enabling apps, starting to a world where data will be always available in real time. If you look at Alibaba, <laughs> If you look at all these new companies, and the biggest trend over the last year has probably been uh, two things. Uh, the rise of Uber. You, you know about Uber? That's that, that new taxi concept. And it's an 80-year-old industry totally disrupted by 1,000 employees without assets with a market valuation of 18 billion. Who learned that at university? That in a year you can build a company without assets and only a thousand employees are being worth 18 billion. It's astonishing. And it is disruptive. The other thing is that a lot of people say, so but when, what, what, what's going to happen with all the jobs? And you know, the economist is predicting that in the next 10, 15 years, 40% of jobs will disappear. But the good news is that different jobs will come back. But how do you anticipate that? And that how can you make sure that at the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, is going to modernize the economy? It will create new values, new economic value. And then let's talk a little bit about that. And so basically, if you look about the evolution of the Internet, 30 years ago it was all about connectivity. 3,000 things were connected. And wasn't that astonishing? We came up with the networked economy. We were digitizing business processes, e-commerce. Hey, you know these people said, do I have to book my own tickets? Is that a benefit? It's happened. And that, that's things like um, studying access to information. Like, like I said, if I tell my kids that I had my first job uh, at Olivetti in, in Italy, that it took me three days by car, and if I wanted to phone home, it took me 24 hours to ask for a landline. They just look at me and they say, but Dad, you don't, do you really understand our world? Do we really still connect? Then we had now, and that's the process we're in, eh? immersive experiences, eh? basically eh, the digitalization of transactions, social networking. Eh? That Twitter, look, look what's going on there. Eh? That I can even correct my own speech if I look so now and then and I see what people appreciate and what they not and what they talk about. Eh? That's the first example of... of of live type of data, and that you can basically adjust where you go deeper. Or, but the next one is going to be what we call the Internet of Everything. It's connecting people, it's connecting things. 50, but that's basically infrastructure. But then we generate that enormous amount of data. That data will double every two years. We make it information, like what I said. And then, and that's probably going to be the most difficult one, Dr. Bassem, then, then it's all about how are we going to re-engineer our processes. And because we have learned to study, to analyze, and then to adapt. And we have to start adapting real time. Agility. And in our industry, and we all say that uh, Cisco, we have 40 billion, we have 40 billion in cash, and blah, blah, we have 65% but we are paranoid to not become the next Kodak. Kodak is bankrupt. But the powerhouses can fall over overnight. How do you look around the corner? How do you keep that agility in Dubai? How can you attract investors? How can you attract young people? 
how do you create a sustainable environment? You're never safe. You always have to be paranoid and look for it. And so the Internet of Everything is the connection of people, things, creating data, enabling the data, and people call it a dark data, white data. A lot of companies are appointing at the moment a chief digital, a chief data officer. Cities have a CIO, a CTO, and more and more that they now have a chief data officer. If somebody thinks about all the data in the city and how can we monetize that? How can we have an integrated operations center, for instance, for weather, for thunderstorms, for physical safety and security, and all kinds of good things. Chicago is one of the first cities who really has published a data concept. Who owns the data? It's going to be a big question. Is the data from the city? Is it from the citizens? Uh, I'm on the board of a uh, uh, medical equipment company um, who are in pacemakers. The company says they own the data. The patient said, no, I own it. The insurance company says it's mine. Lawyers will have a fantastic period. They will have, you know, a decade of real prosperity. And it's studying, and, but hey, all these concepts here, all the data that you create, who has the digital rights? All Greenfield. Cities who will lead those type of concepts will have a competitive advantage. Also, privacy and security, big issues that we have to address as an industry. And the future will be that a city or a company will probably publish its manifest and say how they treat data and what they do with it. And then you can opt in and you can opt out. But you want to know what's going on. Where is it stored? How is it secure? What are you doing with it? And so if you don't publish it, if, if you're not transparent, people will start revolting and saying, I don't want this. And then things go slower and people leave. So if you think about it, everything I've said today, and it's so far, 13 billion devices, that's only 1% of what can be connected. And so even the 50 billion is just a drop in the water. And I never make predictions longer than 5, 10 years out, because I've missed a lot of things in the past. And these type of things suddenly emerge, happen, and scale. And but only 1% of what can be connected is connected. IOE as a concept, the internet of everything. Economic value for the next decade, and that is the net present value. And, you know, I have white papers and you can study that, but we think there is an economic opportunity of 19 trillion. I had a radio interview a couple of weeks ago and basically had the reporter stopped it and said, don't you make a mistake here? Are you not miscalculating a couple of uh, zeros? Is it 19 trillion? It's the same as the absolute GDP of the US. Yes, it is. And the, the, the 19 trillion, 14.4 trillion private sector, 4.6 in public sector. And it's based on 61 real use cases. Around 50% will be in innovation and revenue generation. 50% in supply chain and logistics, asset utilization. And take, for instance, buildings. 70% of world energy is consumed in cities. 70% of the 70% is in buildings. Buildings have a utilization of 40%. And mostly they are used five days a week and, and then only eight or 10 hours. Highly inefficient. And so I had the privilege uh, when I lived in India to build C Cisco's second head office. And we have now 12,000 people in a campus. We have a utilization of 90%. People batch in, and then they say, with whom do I want to collaborate today? With whom do I want to work? Where do I want to sit? Do I want to have a closed office, open, uh, a conference room, <laughs> technology? And that, so, utilization of buildings. And, you know, a lot of developers don't like me. Because they like to develop buildings. And they like to sell buildings and <laughs> tenants. But, and so, and these are the, the, the main categories. And so if we build on that, uh, then we see in cities a th three trillion opportunity. And so whatever I say, it's, it's very optimistic. And that there are solutions for all these problems and challenges if you embrace technology as the new essential infrastructure. And you start planning for it, 
consuming it, embracing it. And so these are some numbers uh, I will go. And for UAE, we think that there is a 6.9 billion opportunity in the next three years divided in these two categories. And it's not that difficult based on use cases to generate that type of data. Prioritize and start working with it, do something with it. This is my favorite slide. And so I'm a kid from Rotterdam. And my father was an architect. He was prisoner of war and dedicated his life to rebuild the nation. And so when I think about my childhood sitting on the kitchen table with my dad and he was sketching, and that's now the library, it's the airport, it's their schools. And it's, it's physical. I see myself, my company, and more and more people as digital architects. And so I always look at physical infrastructure and think by myself, I put a digital overlay on top of that. And what do you enable then? And that's where we get all these smart concepts. And so smart cities, smart hospitals, smart highways, smart factories. And that we will have the cloud that's above us somewhere. And where we will have applications, private cloud, public, interclouds. But also, more and more, we will have intelligence, what we call in the edge, close to where the data is generated. And that it, not everything will go to the cloud. And that so designing these type of networks, and it's very organic, it's almost an, a living organism in your city, in your country, in your factory, everywhere. And so application-centric infrastructure, a digital overlay. And, and if, if we just, all companies, and then perhaps you, you disagree with me, I'll hear it later then, but and it, we basically say that all companies will be technology companies. Some people will use it for retail, some people will use it for healthcare, some will use it for financial services. But all companies will be technology companies. And all companies will create their own app stores. And we're just getting used to bring your own device. Now customers and people will come with their own application and say, if you want to have me as a customer, this is what I want you to do. And also, if, if, if you think about this picture, if I go with my boys, again, at 14 and 18, if we go to a city and we come out of the plane, I look around and I look at the buildings and they look around like this. They look at their app. And that's how they think the truth will be somewhere in the middle. But it, it's a given. So Barcelona is one of our case studies. Um, and it's, it, it's a smart city. The next 10 years, 3.6 billion value at stake. And it, it's really divided in uh, at smart lining, smart buses, smart water, smart bu 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 everything smart. Uh, but the numbers are the proof points. Uh, Barcelona started 10 years ago, and it was not called smart cities, uh, but 1,500 new companies attracted. They created 44,000 new jobs. And uh, the old mills, around the harbor have been transformed. And where uh, an academic world with small and medium business works together. And a little bit what Dubai has done with the internet city and uh, creating a cluster of stakeholders who come together and do something creative. Uh, mobile collaboration, the future of work could be a lecture in itself. There will be a uh, cost reduction of 1.6 billion. Smart water, smart parking. And uh, for most mayors in the world at the moment, Parking is the second source of income. Don't raise the targets, increase parking fees. Did you know that an average citizen in Paris is spending four years of his life looking for a parking place? 30% of congestion in cities is people looking for a parking place. And you book a restaurant, you book a hotel, why shouldn't you book a parking place? It, 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 it's a great opportunity. I was a keynote speaker at uh, the National Association of Parking, and all my colleagues said, what are you doing there? You know, Old-fashioned. No, it's an industry and it is being disrupted and transformed as we speak. Smart water, smart lighting. You know what probably is the best? Uh, and that's, so, that's the mayor, uh, Mayor Xavier Trias of Barcelona. He's now recognized as, by fortune, one of the 50 most influential business people in the world because he embraced technology to transform his city. 
Um, so I have some, some other examples. Hamburg, and we call it the Citropolis. Uh, that we talk about Eritropolis, uh, that uh, city states like my country, uh, that like Dubai perhaps, but Dubai has that unique opportunity uh, between an Eritropolis and a Citropolis, and uh, combining that, uh, that it's a big harbor. And uh, if you see, this is really outcome based. Uh, that's what the city has gained, and there are white papers around. This is Nice. Uh, that was the first city that piloted uh, a decentralization of the town hall. Uh, that people don't have to come to the town hall. Uh, in the US, the, the most uh, cynical joke you can make is say, why should you go to the DMV to renew your driving license? And then everybody knows what to talk about, you know, in a queue for four hours, being not well treated, a total waste of time. Uh, that you, you can do that online or in details. And so this is in Nice. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it, we're going to pilot also here in, uh, in Dubai. It's decentralization of the town hall where you can have access to citizen services. And we had the first marriage, actually. And that somebody wanted to do something different. And it really happened. And, and that, uh, they had a great day, wanted to spend too much time in the town hall. Anyway, um, Amsterdam, I'm not going into that now. It benefits very quickly. And so jobs, FDI, like I showed Barcelona, 1,500 companies, 44,000 jobs. Energy saving, 30%. Easy. Water management. And that Singapore is the first city who plans to be water neutral. Um, if you translate it uh, in English, it says from toilet to tap. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but um, if people are more happy, crime rates go down. Traffic, 30% reduction is easy. And then, every, I, I haven't really talked about it in depth, but in an, in an aging population, cost of health care, 70% of doctor's calls don't need physical interaction. And the most prosperous thing you have in life is your body. What do you know about it? And most people have an analog weight scale at home, and that's it. Have you just entering now wearable devices where you will get real-time information and we will get drugs that you swallow with a mini chip in it and it will produce data and tell you how your body reacts. And it's, it, it's just getting started. So healthcare, $3 per doctor's visit is easily achievable if you do it more virtually based on modern technology. Education, $3 per student per month. More and more accessibility uh, that you have to be together. And that like we are here together. And that, but a lot of things you can also do virtually and online. It's around that, that, that mix that you have to find between physically presence and remotely. And so my, my closing, um, what does it take? What, what does it take to, to really embrace this concept and to build it as a new industry? First, it needs thought leadership. If there is no vision, um, there is no future. Um, and it, what is the biggest risk? Not taking a risk. And it, I really like that. It, it's a fantastic quote. Uh, but work with companies who talk about global open standards and who want to really set new standards to embrace these type of concepts. Smart regulation. That's going to be one of the biggest key factors. And uh, as an example, in my mini Cosmos, the home, uh, we lived four years in India, um, and we had servants for everything. We went back home uh, with my two sons, and you know, boys, uh, they never clean up their room and they never switch off the light. And so my electricity bill was going through the roof. I built a dashboard, we had 10% saving, and then smart regulation, I now gave, gave them 50% of the saving in their pocket money. <laughs> we now have a bottom all off. <laughs> if I'm not careful, I'm sitting in the dark, you know, when they go to bed. Yeah, but the point is that regulation can create a lot of incentives to change behavior. And so thought leadership combined with um, smart regulation, public-private partnerships, participations, nobody can do this alone. Not as a company, not as a city, not as a government. And we really have to embrace these new ways of working. And uh, that in the 80 type of city engagements, at the moment we have 40 different business models. And it is not going to be one, because every city is different, but it's not going to be 40. It probably end up with five, ten type of business models, with templates. Uh, but it has to be agile. 
And then last but not least, a new ecosystem. Uh, that's, uh, we have to work as industries together. Uh, that's, uh, like Cisco, we have to come out of just the CIO. Uh, we have to talk to operational technology. Uh, we have to work with companies like Snyder, Siemens, and Honeywell, the Pacific Control here in Dubai. Uh, that, that you will see that that's, the industry has also to find its new horizontal type of working together. Thank you very much.